Think of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. Try to get a rhythm of breath that feels good. You can experiment with longer breathing. In fact, it's good to start out with a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. And if that feels good, you keep it up. And if not, you can change. Shorter, deeper, shallower, heavier, lighter, fast, slow. Lots of different ways of breathing. Sometimes you need to breathe in a way that gives you more energy. Other times you need to breathe in a way that allows you to relax. When you've got a rhythm that feels good, start exploring the body, how the process of breathing feels in different parts of the body. Because this energy in your nerves is very closely related to the energy of the in and out breath. The energy in your bloodstream, all those little muscles that line your blood, blood vessels. The flow of energy through them is related to your breath. So you want to get a sense, sort of focus in, use your magnifying glass to focus in on different parts of the body to see how the breath feels and see if there are any locations where you tend to tense things up, tighten them up, but the energy doesn't flow very well. And learn how to breathe in a way that allows them to stay relaxed and open all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. Because eventually you're going to be going back to the larger perspective again, having the whole body as your frame of reference. But you want to be able to stay centered in one spot. And think of your awareness spreading out from there, which means that before you Focus down on that one spot. You want to clean up things in the different parts of the body so you don't have to keep running back and forth. You're creating your own space. You're filling your own space. This is important. If you can't feel at ease in your own body, there's no place in the world you're going to feel at home. This is your territory. This is your position of strength. Nobody else has the right to be here as much as you do. We see this in the animal world sometimes. A larger dog is chasing a smaller dog, and suddenly the smaller dog gets into its territory, can turn around and chase the bigger dog away. It knows its territory, and the other dog knows its territory. And when you're in your territory, you're safe. The Buddha gives this as an analogy. The quail who leaves the field. Quails are safe in a newly plowed field because there are lots of stones they can hide behind. But there's one quail who left the field, and a hawk swooped down and got it. As it's carrying the quail off, the quail laments, Ah, just my bad luck. If I had stayed in my territory today, this hawk would have been no match for me. The hawk gets a little peeved. He says, Okay, I'll let you go. But even if you go there, I, you won't escape me. So the quail goes down to the field, stands on a stone, taunts the hawk. The hawk comes diving down, but as soon as the quail sees that the hawk is coming full speed, the quail hides behind the stone. and the hawk shatters its breast right there on the stone. So if you're in your territory, no matter how small you may be in comparison to the rest of the world, you've got your space. This is your place. This is your safe place. As the text said, to say nothing about the rest of the world, Mara can't get you there if you're staying in your safe place. So learn how to inhabit this. Don't let anybody else in. Because we do have this tendency to pick up other people's energy that can invade our territory. Sometimes you talk with a person and the person
person's energy is frenetic, and not only while you're there with the person do you feel that frenetic energy after the person's gone, you're still carrying some of it. You don't want that. You need your space. You need to create your own space, and not only fill your own space like this, but also create your environment around you. This goes beyond just the technique of filling the body with your awareness, but looking at the other ways in which you create your environment as you go through the day. The Buddha lists five things that create a good environment for a meditator. It's in a sutta where he's talking about five qualities that a young monk should develop, but it applies to lay people as well. Anybody who's meditating needs to keep these things in mind as to what kind of environment you're creating. We tend to think of the environment outside as pushing on us and forcing things on us as something we can't change. But you've got to have conviction that your actions are creating the majority of the things you sense in your environment. So you've got to look at your actions. What kind of environment are you creating for yourself as a meditator? The first part of the environment is following the precepts. For the monks, of course, this means following all the precepts the monks have to look after. For the lay people, it means the five and the eight precepts. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no intoxicants. Those are the five. For the eight, you change number three from no illicit sex to no sex, period. And then you add no eating afternoon or before dawn, no ornamenting the body and going to shows, listening to music. And finally, no sleeping on luxurious beds and sitting on luxurious seats. The five precepts are especially important in creating your environment. Just take the precept on lying, which the Buddha seems to treat as the most important of the five. If you're very casual about how true your statements might be, you're basically selling yourself short. And you tend to attract to yourself people who are also careless about that kind of thing. Your words don't have much value. People don't give them much value. You just generally create a bad environment for yourself. And if you're used to lying, saying, well, this lie doesn't matter, that lie doesn't matter, how is your mind going to tell itself the truth? It's going to start getting casual about what it says to itself about what's going on, overestimating your, your attainments or overestimating the obstacles that are facing you. You get so that you can't really trust your own powers of observation, because lying involves hiding. And it's not just hiding things from other people, you end up hiding things from yourself. That creates a bad environment to meditate in. You've got to look to your precepts. Make sure you keep your precepts clean. And you find that it really does improve the environment in which you're meditating. It improves the environment in which you're, you're practicing as a whole. The second factor is restraint of the senses. Notice why you're looking at things, why you're listening to things. What's your motivation? Sometimes we think of restraint of the senses meaning that you just don't look or don't listen, but that's not the case. It's just that when you notice, if you focus on certain things, it gives more energy to your greed or more energy to your anger. You learn not to focus on those things. You focus on other things. You look at the same thing. Say there's a a picture that gives rise to lust, or you think about the actual body that's giving rise, giving rise to your lust, and there are parts of the body that you would not want to look at, not want to be near. And it's all part and parcel of the body. Everybody's bodies are equal this way. So it's a matter of knowing what to look for. It also means looking at your own motivation. Because often it's not the case that you suddenly run across something that gives rise to lust or run across something that gives rise to anger. You're out looking for it. And this is why they have talk radio. People want to get worked up, so they tune in to whatever. 
people switch on the internet. They want to feed their defilements. Their defilements are already hungry. They're looking for something to latch on. You've got to watch that tendency, because if you give into it, it really plays havoc with your meditation. So you've got to be careful about what you're looking at, what you're listening to, why you're looking, why you're listening, all the way down through the senses. And the less you clutter up your mind in this way, and the less you give rein to your defilements in this way, then the easier it's going to be to get the mind to settle down. Because a large part of getting the mind to settle down is having some restraint. And if you let loose with all the restraint during the day, then it's hard to clamp down again when you meditate. This is also where it's important to have the breath as your foundation. The Buddha talks about having what he calls mindfulness immersed in the body, what fills the body, as a basis for sense restraint. He compares it to a post. Suppose you had six animals, and each one was on a leash, and you tied the leash leashes all together in one knot. Now, if the leashes were not tied to a post, then the animals would pull one another in all different directions. If you have a crocodile, it'll go down into the river. A monkey, it'll want to go up into a tree. A hyena will want to go into the charnel ground to feed on some corpses. In other words, all the different animals are pulling in different directions. And it depends on which animal happens to be strongest at any one time. That's where they all go. They all get dragged along. If the crocodile is stronger than the monkey and the hyena, everybody else gets dragged down into the river and they often drown. However, if you have a post, you tie all the leashes to a post. And if the post is really firm, then no matter how hard they, hard they pull, they got to stay right there. That's the image for filling your body with mindfulness, filling your body with your awareness. And keeping it there, and making that your foundation from which you look or listen or taste. Whatever you're doing, you want to have this sense of the energy in the body as your post. That way you've got some continuity between your meditations or your form of meditations. You've got the body right here. You're centered right here. So when the time comes to sit down the next time, you're right here. It doesn't involve a lot of pulling and pushing and untangling leashes that have got caught up, or pulling dead animals out of the river. Everything is all right here. Third factor in creating your environment is knowing moderation in speaking. It is good to be a person of few words, if they're well chosen. And at the very least, be careful. Every time you open up your mouth, ask yourself, why am I speaking? Like that sign we have in the, the guest house, W-A-I-T, why am I talking? You always want to know what your intention is, because talking that has no specific intention counts as idle chatter. And if you fill your days up with idle chatter, then your mind is going to be filled with idle chatter, and it's going to be hard to get it to settle down. Focus on something really useful, like staying with the breath. So be very clear that you don't want to misrepresent the truth. You don't want to speak in a way that divides people, just for the satisfaction of seeing them break apart. You don't want to speak in a way that's meant mainly to hurt other people's feelings. You always want to know what your intention is. Because the way you speak is probably the major factor that influences your environment, that creates the environment for the mind. So be very careful about what comes out of your mouth. So John Fulton used to say, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you're going to be able to control your mind. So start here. Make sure that your words are precise, accurate, to the point, helpful to other people, helpful to yourself. Those three tests that the Buddha has. Is it truthful? Is it beneficial? Is this the right time and place? 
you want your speech to pass all of those tests. The fourth factor is finding seclusion. It is good to have a place where you stop every day and have quiet time for yourself. I don't know how many people, I, both here and in Thailand, who say, well, all I have to do is just be very mindful of what I'm doing throughout the day, and that's really what the practice is all about. Your mind needs to have time to itself where it's not taking on other outside activities, other outside responsibilities. Because otherwise all it knows is the mind in reaction to things outside. What you really want to do is have some time every day to get in touch with how the mind is reacting to itself, what conversations are going on in the mind. Having some physical seclusion and also what the, the Buddha calls mental seclusion. Dropping your thoughts of the future, dropping your thoughts of the past, and just staying right here. With a minimum amount of internal chatter. Just enough to get the mind to settle down. The sense of seclusion is also important in the way you go through the day as you interact with other people. As we were saying today, it's, it's often good to be able to step back just a little bit so that you're not in to totally sucked into the society around you. Have the attitude of being an anthropologist, studying what well, this is the way human beings are this time in history, at this spot, in this place. And be aware of the times when their values begin to creep into you. Because it is subtle, the influence that people have on one another. The values you pick up, your idea of what's important, what's not important. And you can see this in the media, the kinds of questions that get raised are generally not the really important questions. They're diversionary. And the big question in life is, why is it that everyone wants happiness, but people are doing so many things that create suffering? And particularly, why are you doing things that create suffering? That's the question you always want to keep foremost, and that's usually a question that most people don't ask. So you require some space around your mind so that you should keep that question uppermost in your mind. This relates to the fifth factor that influences your environment, which is making sure that your views are right. In other words, you do have conviction that your actions matter. They do make a difference. Your experience of the present moment is something that's shaped by things you've done in the past, but also things you're doing right now. And you do have freedom of choice. The Buddha never tried to prove that, but he said if you don't believe that, there's no reason to practice. If you can't take that as a working hypothesis, you'll get nowhere. That bewilderment that comes from pain and suffering just stays bewildered. And he says if you don't believe that you have the power to make these decisions, you're left without protection. Because this is your protection right now, the fact that you can change the way you focus on things, you can change the way you interpret things, you can change the, que the questions that you take as important. There are potentials for pain, there are potentials for pleasure right now, and you have the choice to choose which ones you're going to cultivate and amplify. And you want to make the most of that opportunity. I remember a meditator one time who was following a meditation method in which he was advised not to do anything at all, just know what was there, and just be with whatever came up. And He'd meditated for several years, nothing really bad had ever come up, and then suddenly on a very long retreat, some really scary stuff started coming up in his mind. And he had been indoctrinated enough to believe that he should just be with whatever came up, but it was making him paranoid. And no matter how much the teachers told him to 
step back, relax, don't push things so hard. He felt that they were now lying to him. I mean, he'd been taught that you just have to be with whatever comes up and not do anything, and that somehow is going to give rise to insight. Well, that's not the case at all. Your basic assumption is that you are shaping your experience out of the raw materials from your past actions, and you want to be able to do that skillfully. That's the beginning of right view, that you can do that. You can develop those skills. That's how belief in karma then grows into an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering, but there's a cause. The cause is there in the mind. It's something you can do something about. There are factors in the mind that you can convert into the path. You want to develop those. So that you can realize the end of suffering. This is possible. The real work is in here. Our environment nowadays tells us that everything of interest is out there, something someone else is doing some other place. And that's a value that you have to resist. Always keep very careful watch on what you're doing, because it really is important. So these are the ways in which we create our environment. So don't let yourself be a passive victim of unhealthy influences from outside. You want to create your own space here, both inhabiting the body and having a very clear sense of what you want to protect in the mind. And just like an electric current that creates a magnetic field around it. By focusing on your actions in this way, you can create a sort of protective cocoon around yourself that shelters your practice, protects your practice, gives it an environment in which it can grow. To try to keep these five points in mind, observing the precepts, restraint of the senses, moderation in talking, finding seclusion, both physical and mental, and making sure that your views are right. Because these are the factors that shape your environment more than anything else.